Good afternoon. Uh, it's truly a pleasure and an honor to be here. Thank you to Carla and the Lumen organization for making it happen. My name is Scott Draves, and I'm going to be telling you about an artist's perspective on selling digital art. Uh, I think in the program it says the artist's perspective, but I, I think I can really only speak for myself. There are so many artists, and we, we all work in, in different ways. Um, so this is going to be a, a personal story. And by necessity, since my artwork is really sort of intertwingled with how it's uh, sold and, you know, sort of, uh, and how it sort of moves through our society, I'm going to tell you a, a little bit about my artwork as well. And this story goes back to the 80s. Uh, does anyone recognize this picture? A, somebody said yes. Gnu? It's a GNU, yes, the animal. Uh, and this is the mascot of the free software organization. So I've been programming computers since I was a kid back in the 70s. And by the time the, uh, the late 80s rolled around, I was at that uh, Brown Computer Graphics Research Group that Anne mentioned uh, uh, a few minutes ago. And so uh, I was you know, doing research in computer graphics, and so doing a lot of computer programming, and I discovered there was a, the software tools that we used to, uh, to work, to, to write code, were actually free downloads. They, weren't, they didn't come from the computer companies and they were produced by this organization called the Free Software Foundation. And I became sort of quite enamored with the philo this philosophy. It seemed like a whole new way of, uh, that information uh, could sort of uh, uh, work with society. And I think it's really sort of the essence of, you know, information wants to be copied. Uh, like the, the Ascribe guy said, you know, like the pure digital copies that's what makes information different. That's its, uh, its special property. And so I think it's sort of so a, a true digital art maybe, uh, you know, sort of wants to be copied in a way. And so uh, the, the Free Software Foundation was sort of the, the foundation of uh, how to work with information that can be copied. Uh, but that, of course, is inimical to the traditional uh, the art world's idea of the, the you know the unique object. Um, so the, the the first image I made that you could really call that was officially called art that was made with the, the intention of art is actually this one, flame number 149, and it is I think the first uh, open source artwork. It was uh, part of a series, and uh, it was it was here's here's another one in the series. They were, these images were not sort of painted. Uh, they were not sort of painted in a, you know, in f the equivalent of Photoshop either. Uh, they were created, you know, with an algorithm. In fact, they were created by solving an equation. So, you know, th computer graphics are normally done with the metaphor of architecture, you know, like a, a drafting where you tell the computer to, to draw a line from these coordinates to those coordinates and you get what you asked for. The computer is kind of like your slave that follows the program that you wrote for it. But uh, I was interested in doing something different, which is you know, not sort of getting what I wanted, but getting something that I hadn't even really imagined. I wanted the computer to surprise me. I wanted the computer to be creative. And uh, my whole art career has really sort of been about sort of blurring that line and finding out sort of like what, what really are the limits of what computers and the, the digital world can do. And so the upside, uh, one of the things that's really interesting about an equation like this is that it can produce images that uh, don't have that sort of mechanical properties that, uh, that uh, normal computer graphics do. It doesn't, it's not made, they're not made from straight lines. Uh, it doesn't sort of look like it's made out of a plastic object. It has texture. It has like a, you know, like brush strokes. It has some of the subtlety that the, the natural world has. And, th you know, that's a big question. To what extent can the digital world sort of recreate the sort of the essence of 
uh, the physical world? You know, can the digital world have the same, you know, the soul uh, of the physical world, of, of, the, of the world that we know and love? Now, here's an image that um, I didn't make directly, but is, was made with my algorithm. And so because I was really into this idea of open source, not only did I make these images, but I put the algorithm, the, the software code that solved the equation on, on the internet, on the web, with the intention that other artists would download it and use it to make their own work. And, uh, and they did. So here's an example of an artist uh, who made an image and then it got used as uh, the album cover for Paul Simon. And he here's another example of uh, Stephen Hawking's book, The Grand Design, where that sort of uh, five-pointed star galaxy thing was created with this flame algorithm. And so this makes it even harder maybe to, to sort of sell your work because if the algorithm that produces it is a free download, not only, uh, and other people can use it, it's sort of, uh, you know, the question is, does that, you know, devalue, does that, is it even like less, that make, make the things less than a copy because not only can I copy my artwork, but I can, you know, I can make my own with just a few clicks. So this is really, again, the and at this time I was really indulging in the the special property of the digital and the computer world of being able to make lots of uh, copies and make lots of variety. Uh, here's another program actually that I did in the sort of now in the mid '90s. This program was called Bomb, and it was an interactive sort of visual musical instrument. So something that you could play maybe the same way that you would play maybe a trumpet, but instead of producing sound, it produced visuals. And uh, this is something I sort of made at home alone in the dark for my own entertainment, but I, I sort of discovered that other people liked it too. And then when it came time to try to, uh, when I had gotten serious enough about my artwork and it had sort of started to become popular as like a free download uh, and as something as software that other artists were using, eventually I decided, well, this uh, phenomenon is something that I want to, you know, do full time. Uh, I had been, like I said, I was very, I was doing computer graphics research. Eventually, I, you know, got a PhD. I became an academic. I was working in Silicon Valley, you know, doing startups. I had a sort of a tech career going on, but I was the art thing was happening also, and I was like, well, the art thing is really what's driving me. That's what I want to do. But if I'm going to do it full time, I have to sell it because uh, I got to pay the rent. So, my first idea. Uh, on sort of like how could I sell something which was so intrinsically digital and copyable and algorithmic and, and sort of software and f as part of its original concept was free. It turns out uh, I'm with William Latham. It turns out the, the raves were actually a receptive audience. And so my idea, my business model was that, you know, the, the art the algorithm is free, you can copy it yourself, but if you want a live performance from the artist, you have to hire me, I will come and do the visuals for your party. And this turned out to be a great way to be invited to a lot of parties, <laughs> but not, not a great way to make money. Um, their parties got pretty big, some of them, this was a more corporate event. Um, let me think. This was actually uh, Burning Man, which was an important uh, touchstone for me. Uh, I was the first VJ performer at Burning Man, and uh, this was uh, this wasn't the first time, but so several years later, I you know part of the problem, part of the reason the VJing is not a great way to make money is you have to buy your own projectors, you have to set up your own screens. If you're the DJ, you know you just bring your records, you're all set. If you're the VJ, you have to, br to do all your equipment, and then you know the DJ gets paid more anyway. And the whole club business is about, you know, like uh, selling alcohol. So it just, I didn't really feel like I was uh, in the right place for my career. Like my artwork was not really being valued. Uh, Burning Man, though, was also uh, was a very interesting place. It's part of also part of the free sharing economy from California. Kind of that situation. Everyone brings their stuff and shares it. That's kind of like the precept of Burning Man. 
but I, it's a but it is so it's not a great place for making money but it is a a great place for making art and i had an experience there in particular uh this night where i had set up my big projection screens and brought my projectors and was projecting on the screens and then there was one of these legendary dust storms where the wind came and basically knocked everything down and i was like oh shoot this is like what am i going to do for the rest of the week uh and so fortunately we had the idea of like oh my gosh the the desert itself the gr the surface of the ground is the ultimate screen it's perfectly flat and almost white and so i mounted the projector higher and shone it down onto the ground and then allow let this also allowed people to walk into the image and so the the artwork was on their bodies and sort of sort of furthering that idea of the blending between the physical and the digital uh that, and that, so that turned into other kinds of uh, great for sort of gallery and museum experiences. But again, uh, not something that was really easy to uh, monetize. So then my sort of second idea was, okay, well, how about, uh, you know, the, how about I just make DVDs? Because this is great content. So I made a, a DVD called Spotworks. It was actually the first... Uh, Creative Commons licensed DVD. All the video was uh, freely available, but especially in the early 2000s, downloading lots of videos was really hard, playing the back was really hard. If you just buy this DV DVD, it's very convenient. You just pop it in, you play it, you can have a good time. So I, I sold thousands and thousands of these DVDs, but as the musicians will tell you, you know, you only get a couple of bucks for each one, and even though thousands and thousands is a big indie success, a uh, couple thousand dollars doesn't actually uh, pay the bills or let alone put your kids through college. So uh, I had to move on and, and keep trying new stuff. So let me just, I tried selling clothing. That does pretty well. Uh, but uh, I still do that. But meanwhile, the, com the computer graphics, you know, just, but uh, here, let me just tell you, say, say one more thing about the clothing. I I I love make I love the sh I love the shirts. I do shirts especially. Uh but the the problem with them is they they are basically still. And for me the artwork I'm tr I'm trying to create an artificial life form. It's it's supposed to be animated in its natural form. It's it's alive and animated. So and it just kept getting better as the years went by because of this evolutionary process and so and it was on a it was on a screensaver. So I'll just add one more thing. Uh, in order to solve that equation, it was actually very difficult mathematically. It takes basically an hour of computer time on a regular PC to solve the equation to produce one frame of animation. What that means is it takes a day to produce one second, and so one computer working by itself just can't really uh, entertain you for very long. So uh, in '99. Uh, sort of inspired by the SETI at Home project, I had the idea to solve that by using this distributed screensaver idea. And when you're not using your computer, your screensaver comes on and goes to work. It sort of joins the network of all the screensavers, and they all work together as a supercomputer to create the art. Uh, and that way, I'm able to like make these images be animated in high resolution. And uh, furthermore, let me just skip through a few. It's, it, it, this algorithm is really special and uh, in its the variety of images that it can produce. That's, and that's uh, uh, part of what I consider the essence of life uh, in its ability to be unpredictable and keep surprising me. That's what I'm really trying to do with this software is write something which uh, keeps doing new things. You know, any physical system can be predicted by an equation. Uh, it's only uh, living systems which can uh, really surprise you. And so to do the design processes like uh, Mr. Latham, I'm using Darwinian evolution. So these images uh, can mate with each other and evolve. And in fact, the audience, so I'm, I'm tapping into the, all the distributed supercomputers, sort of the collective horsepower of the internet to create the animations, but then it's all the people behind all the computers that are watching and interacting with it, and it's their collective aesthetic that guides the evolution. So it's actually a popularity contest among the audience to decide 
where the animation goes and what, what it makes more of. And this makes lots and lots and lots of sheep, uh, which is, again, is a problem for selling things. Here we have a surfeit uh, of images. What, what's the value of any one of them if there, if there, if there are so many? So I, I found a way sort of around this, though, which is interesting and is kind of, uh, and that is to not try to sell the screensaver, which, uh, which is kind of like a, a unique process that's worldwide, uh, but to instead use it as a factory to create uh, high quality aesthetic objects that, that satisfy some of the properties of the, that the traditional art world needs in order to make art sort of have value so that it can be respected and it can go into the, that museum or that collector's home. Uh, and the, 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 th the three things I did were, one was uh, increasing the resolution. So instead of like TV resolution, I used super high quality, high def video. And that's important because for, you know, having thousands of computers rendering your animations for you is great, but having thousands of computers downloading videos from your server is really expensive. And so I was always limited by the bandwidth or by the, by the video quality of the screensaver. I could not increase the quality because that would increase my server bills. But then I realized, oh my gosh, I can make high-res high content, but just don't distribute it for free on the internet. Make, download it onto a single machine, and then make that machine be a unique object. And so it's digital, but it's a, a very, very large database, many gigabytes of high-quality video. And so, uh, that's, uh, the, so that quality is one thing. The, no, it's no longer a re really a reproducible, it's not like a file that you can download. It's a huge, unique object. And then the, the, the final point is the, an aesthetic one, a design one, which is perhaps the most in interesting. And that's that, you know, when the, the screensaver is, you know, driven by its audience, it's kind of like interactive with everybody who's watching it. It's based on that Darwinian evolution. It's like an AI trying to satisfy its audience, its hum the, the, the human uh, element, uh, which is cool. But there's a downside to that too. The, the, the sheep, the designs that win in that situation are the designs that appeal to the lowest common denominator. Uh, le just like politicians may not be your favorite people, uh, the sheep that succeeded in the screensaver environment I, were not the ones that I thought were truly beautiful. So, uh, so what I did was I went through the thousands and thousands of sheep made by the factory by the network and picked out the handful that I thought were beautiful and those are the ones that got turned into the collectible limited edition artwork. Okay, uh, and then making them sort of, here's, here's an example of sort of making it into a physical object a little bit more so you can see, and then and that turns out something that can hang on the wall that is unique and that is beautiful is something that, for example, a corporate client or an art collector will actually pay money for, uh, and that's, I've found, the, the most sort of successful uh, route with the digital art so far. Uh, but there's, a, pr but there's a, a problem with that, too, uh, which is, even though this is really wonderful and I, I love making it and uh, it's successful, there's only very few people who will ever see it because it's expensive and it's, it's in environments like this. And so I wanted some kind of compromise, something that was, uh, you know, better than the screensaver, but uh, but was universally accessible. And so that's where the sort of the freemium thing comes in. What I'm working on now, and has not quite released, but uh, look look for it soon, is what I'm calling the gold sheep, and it's going to be a subscription to the screensaver, like Pandora or something like that, where you put. Uh, 10 or 20 bucks into the slot, and then you get a, a, a higher quality experience that's sort of somewhere in between in the aesthetics, it's in between in the price. And I think, I'm hoping that that sort of compromise uh, uh, vehicle for the electric sheep will allow lots more people to experience it, 
and uh, and that will sort of, you know, we have 450,000 users. If one percent of them participate, you know, that's an, that will be enough to really bring a, a feedback loop into the electric sheep system, and uh, it's already paying its bills. But the more the the more that the screensaver can uh, can develop, it becomes like uh, an independent entity, like an artificial life form that, you know, even if I were to disappear and die, because it has its own bank account, because it's paying its own server bills, because the computer is hiring its own developers, it can sort of, uh, you know, uh, persist and uh, be like an ongoing thing in virtual reality. That's sort of the, uh, the objective. So uh, you can find out more about it on electricsheep.org. You can find about more about me on scottdraves.com, and I have a Twitter feed too, and definitely sign up for the email list or the Twitter feed if to get the announcement of the gold sheep. It's really imminent. I've been working on it for years. It's almost done. So thank you very much for your attention, and uh, I hope to hear more from you. I'll be here afterwards.